Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the first meeting of the Southwest London Integrated Care Board. I'm Millie Banerjee, I'm the chair of this meeting. Let me first welcome all the members of the public. Thank you very much for coming and you'll get an opportunity to ask questions right at the very end. Uh, but thank you very much for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. I want to welcome board members as well, uh, new board members. We're all here in a slightly different capacity than we are normally, and welcome. I'm sure we'll do good business together. So there's a lot of formal stuff at the board today, so forgive me reading my notes. You wouldn't normally see me doing that, but I will today because uh, we need to be sure that we are properly correct and, and conduct our business properly. So from today, we are now a statutory organisation and that makes a real difference to our, uh, what we are required to do and we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, but there are some domestics that I have to tell you about. First of all, we are being live streamed, so welcome to the audience out there, thank you very much for joining us. And we will upload the outcome of this meeting on our new smart websites, so we look forward to that. Um, please use your microphones that are sitting around the table, uh, mainly uh, to uh, make sure that the cameras catch our voice, uh, but also to make sure that everybody can hear. There's also a hearing loop that's available, should you need to use it, uh, do, and if you don't know how to use it, ask Ben. In general, ask Ben. If anything you don't know, just ask Ben. That's, uh, that's the best advice I can give you. Um, so just to be very specific, um, I want to remind everyone this is a meeting of the board being held in public. This is not a public meeting, um, so there's a real distinction between the two, and I'm sure that you all understand that, but I thought it was important for us to record that right at the very beginning. So it's a very nice environment, isn't it? Um, and thank you, everybody who's organised that. It feels right. Uh, but we are not going to have any fire alarms today, uh, as far as we are aware. So if, there's a fire, if there is a fire alarm, then something goes wrong, follow Ben. Uh, that's what I'm going to do, so I'm not going to read the rest of it, you know, just go where he goes. He knows what he's doing. Okay, uh, now, inevitably, uh, there will be acronyms and jargon and, and so on. Uh, I'm sure that we will get used to them, but if not, there's a glossary around, um, so please feel uh, uh, that you can use it. So, um, I want to remind you that please ta uh, put your phones on silent, please. Thank you very much. Um, if there is any kind of emergency, because I know we are in a, a full of healthcare professionals here, then just feel free to leave the meeting. We will, we will understand, and that's, that's how it should be. It's most important that we do the right things for our patients, always. So don't worry about that, just go. So we will take uh, questions from the members of the public right at the very end, but we will also have some uh, observers, and we will take questions from them as well. So we will come to that at the end of the meeting. We will take questions from the observers and then questions from the members of the public. But during the meeting, obviously, it's board members and any presenters who will be contributing to the discussion. Now, somebody's phone is playing a musical note. I used to be on a board where the chair told me if anybody's phone went off and played a musical note, they would have to dance to that music. <laughs> and that, I can tell you, put, put absolute stop, because people were terrified of being asked to do that. I won't make you do that, but don't get me to a point where I have to. So turn off your phones. Okay, um, so I have some apologies to start with. Ruth Bailey, our non-executive member, is not able to be here. Ruth Dombey, apologies from her. John Byrne, our new medical director, is not able to be here. Uh, Joe Farrar, Community Services and Kingston is not here. Matthew Kershaw is a place member for Croydon, but also the Chief Executive of Croydon Hospital is not here. Ian Thomas, who is a participant for local authorities, is not here either. So they're all very sorry. They've all written me notes saying how sorry they are to miss the first day, so we, it couldn't be avoided. And we have uh, Kelly Palmer here, who has to leave at 12, Kelly. So just get up and go, okay? Thank you. And we have uh, a note taker who's going to take notes. Yvonne is going to take notes, a very important person. As I've reminded Gurvinder already, the notes must represent what we do discuss. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, so we are core eight, yes? Okay, thank you. 
Um, so declarations of interest. I hope you've all declared your interest as you should have done. But if during the meeting any uh, topic come up where you have to or you should, uh, better to be on the safe side than be sorry. Just declare your interest so that we all understand what, where you're coming from. So I'm going to start off the meeting with saying a few words about this board, and I have written them down. The reason I've written them down is because I think they are very important. Um, to my mind, and the, I'm, I'm trying to set the, the kind of context of the tone of this board because we are a new group together, and I would like this to be recorded as the, as the way forward. There'll be lots of discussions, but at the beginning of this uh, relationship, I want to put something on record, if I may. So welcome to the South West London ICB. Uh, from today we become accountable, uh, and that is an important difference, that we become statutorily accountable for achieving the objectives that have been set for us by the Health and Care Act. And it's very important uh, for all of us to use those objectives to frame all the work that we do. And just for the record, the objectives are we're required to improve the outcomes in population health and healthcare in South West London, we're required to tackle inequalities in outcomes, experience and access, and all those three things are really important. We have to enhance productivity as well as get value for money. And lastly, and this is a little new to us, and I'm very pleased that we've been given this opportunity, is we should be here supporting the broader social and economic development of South West London. So whatever we do, I would ask you to just bear in mind that that is what, it is, what we are here to do. That's what we're required to do by Parliament. Most importantly though, we are required to achieve these objectives by working collaboratively across the system. It's actually um, a duty uh, for of us to work collaboratively and I know in South West London you've been doing that uh, a lot during the last two years, but here we are now, that's the normal way of doing things, so it is important for us to remember that. And you're all here, I'm sure you know that, because you bring specific skills and experience and in-depth experience of the full range of expertise that we require to fulfill those objectives given to us by Parliament. You've all been through a process and you know what the process has been to be appointed to this board, including me, and I got appointed a while ago, uh, and the executive members, and very specifically, uh, we've kept a very close eye on making sure that we do have, as a board, a group of people who bring that whole range of expertise and experience. Um, so it's not about just individuals, it's about all of the board members working together. Uh, the priorities for this board will reflect local needs and indeed, very importantly, ambitions for the board. Ambitions for our uh, patients and our residents. The Integrated Care Partnership Committee, which is due to meet on the 15th, uh, 15th or 13th, Ben? 13th, 13th, um, will actually be developing those priorities further. So we're not starting from a blank sheet, but it is important in this new structure that we review the priorities, so we will be doing that. And, and the ICP will have very wide representation from all of our partners, and we'll be working very closely as an ICB. Uh, I'm, I'm the joint chair of the <coughs> ICP, so we'll be working very closely with the ICP. Uh, but also we will be working with individual partners and that will continue as it has done before only with even more intent. And of course always, always these strategies uh, will be driven by the needs of our local population and the patients. But it's very important for me to stress right at the beginning is this board by law is constituted as a unitary board. So the decisions we reach here as a board will be the decisions which we will all take away from here. And that is a very important part of the way we work together. And I'm sure you'll join me always in working to achieve consensus, but equally it's very important uh, that we work to achieve the best outcomes for across the system. And that does mean that we have to look for the highest common denominator, and not be satisfied with the lowest common factor. It is really, really important that we work in a unitary fashion. And I know that you will be committed to that, and I know that that's what you absolutely understand as you take on your responsibilities as board members. We will be making difficult decisions. The world is like that, it's full of difficult decisions, so we will be making them. 
but uh, we will want to uh, make sure we challenge ourselves as we make those decisions, that we understand what those decisions are about and have the courage. We have to have the courage to make decisions which may not be obvious, but we do need to make them on behalf of the people who have sent us here, and that is our residents and our patients. The other important part of this decision making is we need to be balancing now and the future. Uh, life's very complicated like that, and we will forever be seeking to understand in our own minds and as a group of people how the decisions impact on now and in the future. So I do look forward to our debates. Um, they should be rich with data and evidence supported by very well evaluated options. We don't want to be presented with one option, one option only. And I'm sure if you find that as board members, you will want to question that and please do that. We will always, of course, work professionally. But looking around this room, I know that we will work with passion and that's what it should be because we are here in the people business. We are here to help people do better in their lives, to age well and to live well. And that requires some passion. This is not a cold professional world that we are in. So I hope that we, we very much engage in that way. But also, I think we have to be a learning group because the world is changing around us. There's lots going on around us. So we will, as a board, um, make sure that we have the opportunity to learn, learn from each other, but also learn uh, from others. And we'll be developing programs for the board to, to learn together. But at all times, and I, hardly need to say this, but I will say this for the record on your behalf, that at all times we must fully understand the impact of our decisions on our residents, on our patients, and on our staff. It's very important that we bear that in mind because some of these decisions have very long-standing implications. And these are, I hardly need to say this to you, more than ordinarily challenging times for our patients, our residents. And our staff. So it's a huge responsibility that we collectively take on and we take that on on behalf of all of these people. So this is the first meeting of the board and I wanted to put all this on record. We will be talking with you individually and together how we develop the, the sort of code of conduct for the board. Um, I didn't really want to face you with something written and say this is it, sign here. Uh, I think it's worthwhile for us to have a few kind of trial runs to see how we go and then we'll put that together and we'll sign that off. I'm very keen on um, uh, developing a system for evaluating our board meetings and uh, again that's sort of um, in the making. Uh, we, could, we could do sort of instant evaluations like how was it for you today then, we could do longer term ones so again with your help we will develop that because it is important as a learning organisation to continue to do that. But most importantly of all, and this is the last point that uh, I think it's important for me to make, is it will only work, this group will only work if we work together as professionally as we can and respect each other. So it will depend on developing relationships, not just at the meeting, not just as, as a subcommittee, but actually individually. And I know many of you know each other, so there's a good start. Good relationships are coming to the table already, but there are people here that are here in slightly different uh, guise, if I can if I can put it that way, because remember, it's a unitary board, you're not representing one thing, you're representing a set of skills and experiences. So it is important for us to learn to understand where we each of us are coming from, and we will try to build in these opportunities both around the board meeting for us to get to know each other. So, I would just like to end by thanking you in advance. Um, it's quite intimidating to chair a board meeting of this kind, I don't mind telling you, because you know, as a woman you're allowed to admit to intimidation. As a man you're not, so I always admit to it. So thank you for all the support you've given uh, the, the executive so far. They've done the most amazing job to get us here, and uh, we have a set of papers to, to show for it. Um, but. I think this is only the beginning, so I welcome you again and thank you for joining us. Okay, so let's move on to the substance of the board. I want to say before we start that I was very keen that our very first board meeting had substance. I didn't want it just to be signing off lots of procedural documents, important as they are, because we are a statutory organisation and we must do the right thing and we must be seen to be doing the right thing. So those are important, 
but we wanted a balance between signing those off, but also substance. And you will see the substance is driven by our key challenges. Because although we will continue to develop these priorities, we know what the challenges are. So I hope that you know, you'll all want to contribute as we go through the board meeting. So on that basis, I'm going to turn to Sarah for her CEO report. Sarah. Thank you, Chair. Um, so it's a very brief report. I thought actually I might introduce myself as it's the first meeting and I was wondering if other members when they come in might introduce themselves and, and what their role is on the board. So I'm Sarah Blow, I am the Chief Executive Officer for the ICS and the ICB in South West London. So I have a short report here with only four items. Uh, I'm only going to take a few minutes of your time but I'm, welcome, I'm welcoming questions at the end of it. Um, but I would like to pick out two areas of the report. The first being uh, my thanks uh, for the transition from all of the partners, all of the staff across South West London. There's been a huge amount of work to get us to the point of having the board in place, the partnership in place, uh, and all of the logistics around that, around the governance, the readiness to operate, the due diligence. Uh, and we've closed down one organisation and opened another one for the 1st of July. So I just wanted to record my thanks for both the logistics and all of the staff that have been involved, but also for all the partners for the work that we've done to get to the point where we have a, a, a really varied board uh, around the table today. Uh, the second area that I just wanted to pull your attention to is the messenger review. Uh, and I think this is an important review across the whole of the NHS. Um, and there is a link within my report to the, to the full report uh, by messenger, by Sir Gordon Messenger. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think it helps us uh, to think about our leadership for the future. And particularly in South West London, I know that we aspire as leaders and as a board to be great leaders uh, and that we want to make sure that we demonstrate um, all of the great behaviours that, that Sir Gordon Messenger is putting forward in his report. So I think it is worthwhile us all having a look at that. Um, there is a planning update on here, it's very brief. There is a huge amount um, further along in the agenda on the planning and how we have taken that forward. So I wasn't going to talk about that. And on the Ukrainians, um, I mean, it says the NHS support to the create Ukrainians, but we're working very closely. This is a system-wide response to, um, to, to the Ukraine issues, and we are working with all of our local authorities in South West London to make sure we have a robust response uh, where required. Uh, and I was going to stop there, Minnie, if there were any questions. Thank you very much. Sorry, that's the governance and the procedural uh, part. And I'm going to turn to Karen and Ben to take us through all of the things that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Millie. Um, so my name is Karen Broughton. I'm Deputy Chief Executive of the ICB and Director of Transformation and People. Um, there's quite a lot of information in front of you, as you've already alluded to, Millie. Um, but as board members will be aware, the Health and Care Bill was published in July 2021. Uh, and since then, Health and Care Act has been produced uh, and that received royal assent on the 28th of April. Uh, and that act, uh, as we've already mentioned, dissolves clinical commissioning groups and creates integrated care boards. Uh, and the report that you have in front of you and all of the uh, supporting documents provide the board with an overview of the work that's been undertaken to both close the CCG uh, and create the integrated care board. And it also seeks, therefore, a number of approvals from the board. Um, by, by way of background, uh, in order to get to where we are today, uh, from a CCG to an ICB, uh, we created three things. The first was an integrated um, care transition programme, so quite a wide and varied transition programme to move uh, from where we were to a very different way of working. Uh, that was overseen by the Recovery and um, Transition Board for South West London, uh, which you chaired, Minnie. Uh, we created a governance oversight group which was made up of uh, partners across both the CCG uh, and the uh, system uh, and included uh, system leaders and executives as well to make sure that the, the change had very, very strong oversight. 
Um, and then the final part, uh, driven a lot by national guidance, um, was a due diligence plan. So the things that we had to do to make sure that we created the ICB well. Uh, and we also uh, received assurance on that from our internal auditors to make sure that we were doing what we needed to do uh, in the way that we needed to do it. As part of the pack, one of the things that you will have is the constitution from the Integrated Care Board. Uh, and we developed that with our partners, so system partners were asked to comment, and they did. Uh, and that's been drawn up uh, and approved. And there is also a suite of governance documents um, covering committee structures, terms of reference, policies, etc. And they're all there. And in the interest of time, I thought I wouldn't go over those today. But um, just to summarise, we have... Uh, a paper that provides the board with an overview of the governance processes that we've undertaken to create the board. Uh, the, the second paper provides uh, the final constitution and the standing orders, uh, together with all the guidance notes that we receive from NHS England, so the board can be assured that we, uh, that we have completed that well. The third paper provides an overview of the board's membership and the roles. Um, uh, and just a, a couple of important things to mention since that paper was written, we've also concluded a number of other appointments to the board. Um, so we have uh, appointed Mark Creelman as the Wandsworth Place representative. We have appointed James Blythe as the Sutton uh, Place representative. And we've also appointed um, Ruth Donby as the local authority voting member on the board and Ian Thomas as the local authority participant. So that's a change to the papers that you have, but they, that, those recruitments have now been um, concluded. Paper 4 gives you the um, ICB governance structure, sorry, committee structure, and all of the terms of reference uh, for all of those groups uh, that report to the ICB. And then finally, uh, the final paper provides an ICS uh, update on transition and the due diligence work in closing the organisation that was the CCG and establishing... Uh, and therefore, I would like to recommend that the board do a number of things today. Uh, to note the constitution and the standing orders, to approve the remaining documents and the policies that are transitioning in, it, that are set out in paper two, to note the membership and the appointments that are listed in paper three, but also those verbal changes that I've just explained, and to approve the committee structure and the terms <coughs> of reference in paper four. So, sorry, there's a lot. And then finally, to note in Paper 5 the due diligence work that we have undertaken uh, and also the National Readiness to Operate Statement that the ICS has been required to produce as well. Um, so that's the suite of documents, Millie, in, in summary form. Uh, happy to take any questions. Oh. Thank you very much, Sarah. Yeah, can I just add that yesterday afternoon I did receive from NHS England, and I was just looking at it to make sure I got the wording right, the ICB establishment letter and documents associated with uh, the Integrated Care Board and the associated transfer of the people and properties from any other organisations. Those are now within our governance team so that, that, that all of the finalised uh, documentation has been received from the regulators. Anybody want to add anything to that? So, does the board note and approve the documentation that's been put ahead of you? Thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you very you. much, Karen. And thank you again, Ben, for organising this. It's, it's been no mean task, actually. But it is important to have done that, however difficult it's been. It's been a bit difficult, but we're there. We're there. Good. We're making very good progress, so I'm going to push on because it's useful to give as much time as we need to on each item as we come to that. So that's what I'm going to do. So the next item on the agenda is on primary care. Uh, and what we really want to do here is to review, as far as we are uh, able to now, the, the, the important issues that come out of the fuller stock take, but also to have some discussion about what that means. So am I looking at Mark now to lead that? Mark, thank you very much. Off you go. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'm Mark Krillman. I'm um, the Wandsworth representative on this board, but also uh, holding primary care of the SRO uh, until Tonya Michelides comes, uh, comes back into post. Um, so just to say, in terms of the, uh, the Fuller report and the stock take, uh, in November 2021, uh, NHS uh, England commissioned a stock take of primary care, and it really was to set out a new vision for primary care going forward. Um, we know that uh, primary care is under uh, immense pressure 
Um, demands on primary care are different than they used to be. Uh, Post-COVID, that has even been more polarised as well. And so the stock take basically set out to, to make some recommendations. Um, it engaged with over a thousand people, so actually it was a wide ranging and some people around this table were actually engaged around the stock take as well. And it came out with three offers really, and that was about streamlined access, um, and we know that just in the press access is incredibly important to our, our residents, um, but particularly around urgent and episodic care, so actually getting primary care access when you need it um, immediately. Uh, the other thing was about proactive, personalised care, really making sure that care was wrapped around the individual and that multidisciplines came together uh, to benefit uh, the patient and actually improve the health outcomes. Uh, the third one was around prevention, actually helping people to stay healthy and putting primary care at the centre of the prevention agenda, whether that be primary uh, prevention or secondary prevention. It's actually really important that uh, people are uh, advised how to keep healthy. Um, so, key to success uh, of the full of stock take is going to be the ICS and its leadership, um, and also our primary care network leadership. And we know that across South West London, uh, we have 39 primary care networks. Um, they are in different stages of development. Uh, they, we have a really good platform, but there's much work to be done in us supporting them in really developing community services. Um, the paper sets out kind of what the 15 actions that the, the full of stock take sets out for us. And, and what the paper also does is just gives you some key actions that South West London have already taken. Now, I think South West London, we were already on a journey in primary care. Lots of the multidisciplinary team kind of principles are already there in our boroughs. But I don't want to underestimate the journey that we've still got to go on. Uh, because there really is a, a key, to improve, uh, key to improve primary care as a system. Key actions, though, are around access. So we have just procured uh, a new integrated urgent care provider, um, in particular across 111 and out of hours. Um, also, we have, um, uh, we're evaluating our primary care network's um, access plans and to make sure that our patients and our residents get as much access as possible. Um, another key action is that in South West London, uh, South West London have actually recruited uh, 500 additional posts into primary care and those additional posts are things like paramedics, pharmacists. So we're seeing the workforce really change in primary care. But with that comes challenges. Those people need to be supervised, they need to have a roof over their heads, they need to have the right IT, they need to be integrated into everything that we do. Um, so again, we've made really good progress, we benchmark really well against the others, but actually that does give us challenges as well. Uh, the other thing to say around the report is that it recommends primary care infrastructures. We have absolutely a centralised contracting team. Um, we have local team supporting practices to improve in terms of quality. We need to deliver a much more focused performance and quality um, uh, kind of agenda onto our primary care as we're going forward. And another key action is that we have also just procured a new digital platform for online consultations. So uh, we recognise that across some of our practices, your access to online consultations could be improved. So we, across South West London, we've put in a new platform. That will then extend into things like video consultations and messaging, two-way messaging between practices and patients, but that's, that, that's a, a job still to do. Um, we also need to recognise that digital is not everyone's choice of access, and so therefore it's a multi-channel kind of approach that we need to, we need to uh, affect. Um, we have primary care representation, much of it around this table today at every borough committee, um, but one of the key challenges I think that the, the, the the fuller review uh, sets out for South West London is particularly around workforce. We know our workforce is changing. Uh, we've mentioned the additional roles, but actually what we need to do is really ensure that we're supporting our workforce, making it a resilient workforce, worry about their health and well-being, um, and make sure that we're putting the right enablers in there as well. Primary care estate is going to be really important as we move forward. We know that primary care across the board, uh, the estate's improvements need to happen. 
and we've developed local estates forums in each of the boroughs to, to kind of drive that forward. Um, data, and I know that this is going to be really, really important and I will finish shortly. Data is crucial to us driving improvement in primary care. We, we are developing a primary care dashboard. Uh, we have made some uh, steps forward in terms of data, but there's a long way to go to really understanding what every practice does uh, every day of the week, um, and we are working with our practices to do that. Um, I'd probably stop there in terms of the paper and invite questions. That's okay, Chair. So before we uh, open it up for questions, um, Nicola, is it unfair to turn to you and say, what would you like to add to that? It's not unfair. So what would you like no, to add no, to that? No, it's not unfair. Perfectly reasonable. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, Mark. Um, so just a, a couple of points of observations, really, if I may. Um, just to say that the, the fuller stock take is really provides us with a framework. It's not current policy, but it provides us with a framework. And the model may look quite familiar really because it's something that we've sort of been working towards anyway in, in South West London and um, the models that it suggests are you know, quite closely aligned to, to what we're already um, thinking about. But there's, there's an element of the fuller report which um, I think, and this is, this is a personal view, but I think it's one we need to really think about hard as we move to next stages of implementation about the, um, the model, which is it focuses very much on a, a 30 to 50,000 delivery model. So 30 to 50,000 patients and an integrated um, care approach around that. Now, it's really, really important that this is driven at place, that frontline staff are really bought into this um, in order to, to make it succeed, to make sure that we can, you know, put together our primary care networks with the communities in which they're based and the community services, social care services, and voluntary sector and, and all of that to make this work. But there is another important unit here, which is the practice, and the fuller stock take does not focus on the practice very much at all. And, and I think that's something we're going to have to think about carefully because um, patients, I think, uh, feel very connected to their general practice and the practice team and you hear people talk about the important relationship of trust between their GP or the practice nurse or the kind receptionist and I think we have to take that into account and think quite hard about that rather than just blindly following a model which might be prescribed. I think we need to localise it and find out what's important to people here in South West London. Um, and then really just to say I think it's very important that we develop a sustainable model um, and that that has to be a priority for primary care sustainability for this integrated care board. Um, the workforce, the workload and demand, um, the estate and infrastructure are all very significant issues for us and, and challenging um, and not one of the issues really is for primary care alone um, and you know because of the volume of activity and the nature of general practice and primary care I think the measures we take will need either support from um, or change in or will impact on the other sectors, i.e. the partners around the table. We all need to be involved in, in how we move primary care forward. Thank you, Nicola. Questions and comments from people, board members around the table? Yes, thank you. Jacqueline. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jacqueline Totterdal. Um, I'm here representing the acute providers in South West London and my uh, day job is uh, as Chief Exec of St George's, Epsom and St Helier. Um, it's really just the bit about the interface between primary and secondary care or primary and mental health care because part of the fuller review as you've got in point three of the plan mm. is about that, that bit about bringing out the clinicians from, uh, from providers into primary care but it, it, it it, it's, it's not quite landed in there how we might do that and how we might integrate that in a helpful way so that we are having MDTs for cohorts of patients in a helpful way that centres around those individuals. And I just wondered whether we could just explore that a little bit more, Chair? Yes, I think we should. I'll take a couple more questions and then... I'll take a couple more questions and then I'll open it up for Mark and other colleagues to come back in, Dagmar, and then Carrie. Great, right. thank you very much. I'm Doug Matsoina, I'm Director of Public Health in the London Borough of Merton and I'm here as um, Merton Place representative. Thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to bring a little bit of our local 
authority perspective, because obviously access to primary care, in particular, as Nicola said, access to my GP is an ongoing topic for local councillors. And I'm looking at um, um, Nick, our um, new um, non-executive director, to um, support me here. And what we've heard is what's already happening um, is a real attempt for a much more multi-channel approach. And I think working closer with our local members to really promote some of the changes in primary care, um, they have the ear um, and the eye in the community. So for me, um, um, as a way forward, um, having the PCNs as neighbourhood structures, working a lot closer with the councillors in a constructive way, um, um, I th really think it's a, it's a great opportunity for the board um, to champion that. Thank you. Kelly and then James Bly. Th thanks, Millie. And then Dick. Thanks, Millie. I'm Kelly Palmer. I have a dual role as Chief Executive of the Royal Master and the Cancer Centre, and I also have a role as National Cancer Director for NHS England, but I'm here on the board to represent specialised services more broadly. Um, I'm going to follow... Um, both the previous uh, contributors, actually, um, and Jacqueline's point too. So I think it'd be really exciting to talk about what's happening in primary care and the innovation that's going on, and particularly in my area of, of work in, in cancer. So first of all, we're talking about much more seamless pathways for patients by giving GPs direct access to specialist tests in the new community diagnostic centres. So that's a really exciting sort of transformative development to, to extend that. We're also working with GPs on routes into the system, for example, through community pharmacy. So I think we're missing a bit of the excitement of the transformational work that's going on with primary care colleagues in this document at the moment. So it sort of follows the theme, I think, that my colleagues have both raised already. Important to note that. Thank you. Uh, and Dick. No, James. James and then Dick. Uh, good morning, my name is James Blythe. I'm here as place member for Sutton. Uh, I'm also managing director of Epsom and St Helier and uh, place executive lead for, lead for Sutton as well. I, I suppose my observation is, particularly around neighbourhood teams, uh, I, I think something that we will need to explore as a board is how we find the right balance between consistency of offer across primary care and also the scope for our PCNs and their, their neighbourhood teams to sort of tailor the offer um, and to have some flexibility to, to innovate in the local area because I think that balance between a sort of locally tailored approach and a consistent offer is going to be is going to be actually a really important balance and, and how we lead the system through finding that balance is going to be uh, really important. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. And then Dick? Uh, th thank you. Um, so, uh, Dick Sarabji, uh, uh, a non-executive member of the board, and uh, Mark, thank you very much for, for the reports. R really helpful as I'm starting to try and read myself in and uh, uh, understand what, what's happening in, in South West London. Two questions, or it would just be good to hear, hear a little bit, bit more. On, on um, development and support, supporting workforce, I, you touched on the 500 extra staff, mentioned, mentioned the largely paramedics. I can imagine there's part of the challenge, especially with, with the shortages of people, is thinking about um, who does what and uh, changes to, to, to the mix of what's provided at, at, at practice level. And I just wondered if there was a bit more you could say about that, that the pharmacists doing things that maybe they previously haven't done. The other question I, I, I wondered if you could say a bit more about was the extent of engagement with uh, the six boroughs. Um, one example in particular, I think, goes to estates where um, there's a lot of uh, skill on development and building uh, across the boroughs. And indeed, although, as we were discussing earlier, the London Estates and Infrastructure Board never got the powers it was once promised many years ago, it does tap into a lot of uh, skill sets at the Greater London Authority and that might be uh, a, an opportunity. To, <coughs> there are capabilities there that could help with uh, accelerating the state, uh, primary care estate imp improvement. And I just wondered if you could say a bit more about you know, where we're up to on that. Thank you. And Annette. Thank you. My name is Annette Paltz. I'm a GP in Kingston, where I'm also the primary care provider lead. Um, but I'm here today as the Kingston Place lead. 
And I just, I wanted to just support Kelly in what she was saying. I think we are doing more collaborative work uh, across primary and secondary care than we have done in the past. Particularly, uh, we are doing a lot more multidisciplinary working in primary care. And I think there are some really good examples of that across Southwest London where that work has become embedded and where we are not only using our primary care uh, extended PCN teams, but also working across organizations as well. But I did want to just come back to what to just highlight some of the things I think that Dick and um, Mark had mentioned as well is that primary care as state is going to be really really important in this because what we are finding in primary care is that our teams are growing but there is we're finding it difficult to accommodate all our wonderful staff that we've got working with us uh, now in our PCNs and I think to make collaborative working and I'm a, a huge proponent of collaborative working um, and I think it's by far the best way for our patients to to be um, to be ac able to access and be able to be you know, help them manage their uh, health conditions. But we will need to look at estates. We will need to look at estates for the, that um, locality working, for that network working, and for being able to hold those multidisciplinary services that we're being asked to hold. So I would just echo that and to say that I think supporting primary care in this, and I think that's where our role as an ICS comes in, is to be the supportive enabler to allow local working to really flourish and develop. Thank you very much. Mark, you've heard a number of comments and questions. I'm going to get back to you in a minute for you to address as much of that as you can and for Nicola to add to that if she should wish to in her leadership role. But I have two of my own, if I may, a <laughs> comment and a question. Um, I think just building on what uh, Annette and Dick have just said, that, that, first, that last point, um, it, it is about using our resources as effectively as we can. <laughs> And to my earlier comment about now and in the future, let's also uh, learn from our experiences of the last two years in that people don't have to be physically sat in a building to do certain things. I know that's a brave thing to say now, and lots of people do want to be and do need to be sat in the building. For instance, I fully appreciate us meeting together in person today, but also as we move forward, we need to look at the support of technology to help us to make better use of the estates that we have. Um, so that was a comment. I have a couple of questions. The, 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 the question really, one question is about engagement uh, with our patients and our uh, patient representatives and with the voluntary sector. So I know there's a lot of work going on and uh, you might want to bring Charlotte in at some point, Mark, but, but I think where we are here, what you're hearing from the board is a lot of interest. And, and some questions for you. So I'm going to hand over to you before we then end this item. And so, so Mark, please. So <clears throat> thank you for all those comments. That, uh, 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 much appreciated. Because I think in terms of uh, some of the comments are some of the challenges that we face going forward. And actually just picking up on Jacqueline's uh, points around secondary and the primary care kind of integration. I think we've got pockets of it across South West London. So I know if Matthew would hear, he'd be talking about kind of secondary geriatricians going into primary care settings. Um, and some of the COVID work that we did, we saw a real kind of benefit between secondary and primary care coming together. And we want to really harness that. We have initiatives such as our local kind of hospital at home services that we're beginning to deliver. But it really does mean that we need to kind of change the mindset of both secondary care clinicians and primary care clinicians. I think in South West London, our network approach uh, across specialities where we've got primary care and secondary care clinicians working together to innovate is quite a powerful platform. Uh, so I suppose what I'm saying is that actually there is, there is a lot of work to do, but we have pockets of it that we need to enhance and build and we need to learn from COVID really, I think. Um, Top picking up just in terms of the innovation, and, and apologies because my paper wasn't a widespread kind of this is what we're doing in terms of primary care, because acknowledging all the network work that is going on, there are many innovations across South West London, um, and it's a you know it could be cancer, it can be diabetes. We have a number of different. Programs in different boroughs uh, that, that actually perhaps that's a, a future item at the uh, at the board. I'd suggest that we could bring some of that back. Um, 
PCNs, uh, uh, absolutely just in terms of promoting and working with our local authorities. I think we're now beginning to see that happen. Our PCNs are becoming more mature. Uh, they're starting to build the relationships, but it is really key about the relationships. It's about building the relationships at a borough level with key partners. And that's not just the local authority, it's community services, it's the acute trusts as well. But we have to support our primary care networks in getting there because actually COVID, uh, primary care networks are in every policy statement that's there at the moment. Some are ready to take that on and some need our support to do that. And I think that's a key role for the ICB. Um, just in terms of uh, estates, so we know that we're going to have limited capital estate across all our boroughs. Uh, we are going to have to think innovatively across our partners and work with people like the GLA, absolutely. Uh, what we do need to do, and I think this picks up on, on, on some of Millie's comments, is that we need to look at what is our collective space, how are we using that space. We are delivering services in a different way, and if we looked at Merton again, Merton have the health on the high street, looking at high street estate to kind of deliver primary, and, uh, primary care and prevention initiatives. So I think there's two things. I think we need to look at our our, our collective estate and how we might improve that and utilise it, but also how we might deliver services differently going forward. In terms of engagement, I think in terms of engagement, we have just written out to all our primary care networks a kind of how-to guide around, can we support you engaging with your practices? We have some amazing uh, reference group and uh, patient and public engagement uh, groups already in primary care. And you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We actually want to harness that really good engagement that's going on at the moment. But we want to build on that as well because we want to make sure that when we are engaging from a primary care perspective, it's totally inclusive engagement that we're doing as well. We want to make sure that uh, we are reaching uh, into communities, etc., that we would haven't normally reached into. And one of the key things to that is how do we mobilize the voluntary sector and community organizations and really supporting the engagement and um, so it's not just seen as a primary care engagement it's a much wider engagement with the communities in our boroughs that said we still have lots of work to do i'm not here to say that we've got it all sorted uh, we absolutely need to work and with our partners to achieve that thank you mark charlotte did you want to add anything on engagement i have got another question from mercy to come back to you but I suppose just building on what Mark says, really, we have really strong borough or kind of place comms and engagement groups, which are multi-agency, so working with local authorities, with our colleagues in the voluntary sector and uh, in health watch. And I think that the primary care model, um, sort of the PCN model, is definitely the right way to go because our, our PCNs really do know their local communities and the rich diversity within those communities. And it's sort of our job at ICS level, our engagement leads in each place supporting our PCNs with all of that best practice which we've learned over the vaccine program over the pandemic and really building on that going forward so we can carry on as we've started. Mercy, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I'm Mercy Gersting, a non-executive member. Um, it's, it's just uh, probably from a place of ignorance, Mark, but um, IT and the infrastructure to get systems to speak to each other, especially when you want to uh, gain data from different places is really, really important. And you talk about kind of a new platform and, and stuff. Um, I was just wondering how that's going to work across uh, the whole system. Um, are there, is there going to be an, in, an, you know, an IT infrastructure that is actually going to speak to each other uh, across the system and what are the plans for that? Um, I think that's the $64 million question really, isn't it? So I think there's two things around um, uh, IT. Firstly, there is how do we use IT, how do our patients use IT and digital to actually gain access and get the right advice from the right person at the right time. And that's the platform that I was referring to, that's about online consultations. I think therefore then there's the question about the infrastructure around shared records, about having the ability to, to basically, you know, uh, any, any professional can see up-to-date, real-time data about the person that's sitting in front of them. And, and there is a, a considerable way to go there, really. And actually, we had a, a local meeting yesterday where we spent a lot of time 
wrestling with how we can really drive that forward. Um, and uh, as I suppose some of it is we need to work with our patients around that uh, because actually it would be shared information across the board. We have to consider things like RNG, et cetera. But actually there's also about working, uh, dropping some of the organizational boundaries to achieve that because um, I'm quite an old man and we've been doing, I've been talking about this for quite some time. So I think we do have to kind of try to drive that forward. And I think this partnership, um, can really be a, a driver for that change and I, I'm really hopeful that we can make some inroads into that quite quickly. Thank you. And then Sarah. Yeah, I mean, what, what's really clear from the discussion and from the paper is that, that primary care is kind of the front line of the NHS, isn't it? That, that really delves into our communities and works in a very different way and that the work that we need to do that spans across our system in many different ways but also touches on workforce and digital and all of the things that we need to do. And as part of our five-year plan, which we're going to be developing over the next year, I think we need a really clear uh, strategy for South West London about uh, not only what we're going to do, but how we're going to do it and how we're going to prioritise the different parts of what we need to do, because we're not going to live all of, all of this overnight by the sounds of it. So, um, so we need to, uh, I think we've agreed that we need to do that work together. I mean, we already have, uh, let's not, not pretend that we don't have work already going on and we have lots of strategic intent and lots of work going on in primary care but I think if we want this whole system to come together I think we're going to have to be really clear about what we're going to deliver by when and how we're going to do that so I think that's a piece of work we're going to take away is that correct Mark? Yes absolutely so I think just in terms of uh, we do anticipate that over the next a uh, few years there will be changes to GP contracts etc so actually what we want to do is make sure that we are then planning that into a, a longer term plan. I think at the moment what we're doing and this is part of the, the fuller review as well is to use the fuller review as a kind of template for improvement. Uh, we will govern that through the primary care transformation group and that will then feed into to this board. Um, but yes, absolutely, what we need to do is kind of set out what the priorities are, how we're going to achieve them, and be realistic about what we can achieve as well. Thank you. And before I do summarise, Karen wants to say a few words. So I was just going to come back to, Mercy, your point about um, digital. So about two and a half years ago in South West London, there is an element of shared records between primary and secondary care. I think there's a lot more to do. Um, but one of the things that the Integrated Care Board will have to do this year is to sign off a digital investment plan. And I think it's probably worth at that point just making sure that all those connections are invested in. Uh, so it'll be one of the things that we have to do and pull together uh, as a board. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody for your contributions and your questions. I just want to uh, record uh, the essence of what we've been discussing. And I'm going to do it by using just individual words because I think that does give us a sense. So we've heard about integration and that's really uh, Kelly and, and Jacqueline about the acutes leaning into primary care and to bring your processes and your expertise because the key word for this board is integration. Um, that's what we're here to do. So thank you. That is a key important point to have raised. Um, we've talked about the balance, and James and Nicola have both spoken to it in different ways, and Annette, about the balance between providing for the local community, but also getting benefit from scale and consistency. And that is always going to be a difficult balance to achieve, but I really want to be sure that we understand that is a balance we are required to achieve, because we really must get the benefit out of consistency and scale in some of the investments that we're going to be made. So thank you for making that contribution. We've also heard about the importance of access. And I know that some of the work that's been gone on on inequalities, access is a very important part of it. And we learned a lot of that from our vaccination from COVID and then from a vaccination. So we need to build on that and continue to provide the cap capability for people to access in the way that brings the best outcome for them. Uh, but that's not to say everybody needs the same. Um, so I think, again, that's, a, that's going to be a very interesting discussion on scale and personalization. So we need to be prepared to have that discussion. 
Um, we have heard about our engagement, and that's really on the broader front, and it's important for us to continue to, to, to with that work. So I think, Mark and team, what you've heard is the board is very interested in this. So thank you for bringing it forward to us, because I think it's um, we weren't expecting a, a, a full, this is the next step, and, and that would be uh, uh, premature. Um, but I think what you've heard today is the interest in this board to help you and help everybody in bringing Fuller to life. Because Fuller is a stock take, which is what she was asked to do, but it does give us, if you've said, some indication of the way forward. So we need to take that as a starting point. We need to take what we've already achieved as a state starting point and come back. And no doubt uh, at all about what Sarah said, that uh, the team will be developing uh, specific programs. So on behalf of the board, Mark, thank you very much for the work that already has gone on. And we hope to see you again <laughs> for the next stage. Look forward to it. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. That brings us to the end of our first part of this program. Uh, we've given ourselves a break to go and queue up in the loo and grab a coffee and whatever else you want to do and quickly answer your emails if that's what you want to do. Please get back here at 5 past 11, so don't get lost because I'm going to start at 5 past 11 and we're going to do the next part of the agenda on population health. Thank you very much. <laughs>